Hi, and welcome to week 22 of the Monologue Project, which is ridiculously late this particular go round. Um, I, we ended up moving, uh, I own a store, and we moved our store, and um, I'm, right now I'm in Harrisburg, uh, rehearsing for Pericles with Gamut, and so between moving the store and driving back and forth to Harrisburg, I just plain did not have time. So my apologies, but everything's done now, and rehearsals are started, but the store's moved, and so I can focus back on the task at hand, which this week is Immaculate by Oliver Lansley and the character's Rebecca. I'm, I'm fascinated by this piece. Um, I had just, the timing of it was just really cool, because I had just done this uh, Shakespeare workshop in New York City, where one of the things that we talked about was how punctuation can really sort of give you a clue as to a character's mindset and the first paragraph of this piece which is like a page um, is one sentence so uh, in the the class that I took we were talking about how like sometimes publishers will add punctuation where there was not originally any if you go back and look at first folio stuff and that there's a huge difference between a run-on sentence that goes on for two minutes and a monologue that is broken up into a series of different sentences. Um, having that lack of, of finality of the punctuation really sort of adds to the sense of urgency and almost chaos of this person just trying to spew this information out of their head. So uh, I thought there was interesting timing that this was then the very next piece that I got after having taken that class. So anyway, it's a really cool piece, especially like if you're sort of early, mid twenties, um, Anyway, I kind of I kind of dig in, so we're gonna have some fun with that punctuation information. So this is Immaculate by Oliver Lansley and Rebecca. Hi. Look, there's something I have to say. I I probably should have told you earlier, but I didn't know if it was going to go anywhere. But now I think it is. Oh, I thought it was. But now you're pregnant, so I probably shouldn't tell you anyway because. Stress is bad for the baby, not that you're keeping it, right? God, you're huge. Are those my boots? Look, Michael and I are together. We're a couple. I am sorry. I didn't tell you. I didn't plan it. I, I was out and I saw Michael and I said hello and we got to talking and it came out he'd always quite fancied me, but couldn't do anything about it, obviously, because we were best mates. And I said I fancied him too, which is why I was sometimes a bit of a bitch towards him. Because I think, subconsciously, I fancied him. And I always used to talk to Ed about him, and that's why Ed never wanted to come out with us in a foursome. Because he thought I fancied Michael, which I didn't. Or didn't think I did. But it turns out I did, because I fancy him now. Anyway, we weren't going to do anything about it because you two had just broken up and I knew how pissed off you'd be. But then we said, well, maybe we should just have a kiss while we're both single then, just to, to get it out of our systems. So we had a kiss and then the kiss carried on and things and things and we ended up having sex, which I'm not proud of, but it was good. And it was bad because the condom broke and then I had to get the morning after pill, which was fucking awful. And I was terrified because I thought I was going to have a baby. And you know how much I fucking hate babies because of that dream I have with all the babies that have my mom and dad's faces who shit and piss and cry. and I can't stop them. And also, the pill made me feel really ill. And that was the day we were supposed to go to Blue Water to try to find some shoes to go with that brown skirt you got from Hens. And I said I couldn't come and... I was sick, and you were pissed off, and I wanted to tell you, but I couldn't, and I felt really guilty, and I cried, and then I called Michael, and I told him, and he was really good about it, and made me feel better. And we had decided we weren't going to see each other again, but I was crying on the phone, so he came over, and then he ended up spending the night again, and but we didn't have sex, we just cuddled, and then it went from there. But now you tell me you're pregnant and you say you haven't had sex with anyone since Michael, which means he must be the father, but you don't want to tell me because I made such a fuss about what a fucker he was when he dumped you, which means you're lying to me. 
and he's lying to me and I'm lying to you and you're fucking him and I'm fucking him and he's fucking you and me and I'm going to lose my best friend and my boyfriend. Not that I call him my boyfriend, but technically he is. And I will die helpless and hopeless and friendless and loveless and die old and alone with thread veins and, and bladder weakness and a house full of cats. <laughs>